you do have a choice tonight. Take your hymn books now and turn to hymn number 252. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus tonight. Hymn 252. Let's all stand as we're able to tonight. And our, we'll sing 1, 3, and 4 as the, on, the second, on the second verse. The choir will make the way down as we sing 252. What can wash away my sin? 1, 3, and 4. Ready? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the foe that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Verse 3. Nothing can for sin atone. 
alone, nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done, of Jesus. Oh, precious is a flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And the last, this is all my hope and peace of Jesus. And this is all my righteousness. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And for those of you visitors singer tonight, we sing him 535. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. In 535, in your majesty hymn books tonight. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And may I faithfully do my part to win that soul. And as we pray, you may have noticed as you entered the building uh, all throughout the week that the food's been gathering out there for the Thanksgiving baskets. The only problem, it's not gathering fast enough. So if you still in, intend to get involved in the food drive for uh, baskets for the needy, if you would make sure that you bring that in, you'll have uh, Sunday yet to do that. Uh, you could even bring it tomorrow if you're going to be here. Uh, but if we would see if we can get a little more food out there and, and help some folks uh, have a little better Thanksgiving dinner. Thanks so much for your participation and help in that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We do give thanksgiving uh, this season of the year, uh, especially for your uh, bountiful grace and goodness to us in so many different ways. Lord, you've blessed us spiritually this week. That's the greatest blessing we could ask for. And we've asked and you've given. We thank you for that. We ask as now this offering will be given and received. I pray that it would be sufficient to meet the needs of our brother who has uh, faithfully ministered among us. Put in the hearts of your people to give. We thank you for what you're doing just now. In Jesus' name, amen.
you, Patty, for that arrangement of, at, I guess it was a cross medley of At the Cross and uh, What Can Wash Away My Sins, the song we just sang a few minutes ago. Beautiful arrangement of that song. At this time, it's Leah Nelson and Michelle Chaney are going to sing a song called, entitled Still Sweeter Every Day. so sweeter than he was the day before. Well, it's been wonderful to have Evangelist Richard Flanders with us. I've learned much. I've been revived in many different ways in my own spirit this week. I've learned some new things. He hit us with a new thing this morning. Wasn't, wasn't it? It makes sense. But in chapel this morning, we learned that if it were possible for people to go to heaven without being born again, they wouldn't be happy there anyway. I never thought of that. <laughs> Now, it's impossible, but if they could get to heaven, they would not be happy there. And I learned something else. Brother Flanders told me that he had a Chinese pastor heard him preach, and he said, Brother, you would be good with the Chinese people. They would like you. I'm not sure exactly all that's behind that. I'll just well, take his me. word for it. He didn't speak Chinese. They wouldn't like that. I know that. But uh, uh, we like him, I and we've you. appreciated him. Now, there's a difference between liking somebody and, and really valuing them spiritually in the Lord. There really, really, really is. Sometimes people say, well, Preacher, I, I really like that message. Well, some of his messages I haven't liked, <laughs> but they've been what I needed. Amen? You know what I'm saying, don't you? Brother Flanders, come preach to us. Amen. Thanks, Pastor. Amen. I sure like him, and I sure like you. I really do, and I've had a wonderful time serving the Lord with you this week. 
Now let's all find again the book of Acts. That's the Acts of the Apostles right there at the, after the book of John in the New Testament. Well, I was surprised up here on the platform to find this envelope. Right at the first of the week, someone came to me asking about what they are calling the Revival Tour of Israel. This spring, there's a college, Baptist College of Ministry, that is uh, sponsoring one of those Holy Land trips, but with a new feature, and that is over there, we're going to have a revival conference where we study the doctrines of the Bible that bring revival. And we read about revivals that happen in the Bible while we're standing on the site. It's going to be quite a phenomenal experience, and some are wanting to go. I am a teacher on that. I'm a guest. I'm not one of the sponsors of it. But we ran out of the brochures, and I uh, emailed someone. They said, we'll get them to you by Friday. And I was full of unbelief. I didn't believe it would get here. Here they are, and if you're interested in just looking at it, and one thing about it, the brochure is free. The trip's not free. But I'll put them right down there, and I'll be glad for you to look at them. You know, Pastor has been gracious and uh, very helpful, all of you have, all week long, and I have been uh, felt warmly received and all of my needs have been met and I'm going to be around tomorrow for the brunch and enjoy the fellowship and I truly do enjoy and also love the people at uh, Faith Baptist Church of Deltona. Spent a little time in the neighborhood talking to people about Christ, inviting people as you have. I felt a part of things big time and in one way I pray definitely that the Lord will put my mind and heart with you so that I will be a part of things from now on by praying. I should mention this, Acts chapter 7, turn to chapter 7 while I'm talking. I should mention this, I have had an unusual number of people get a hold of me and say they're praying for us. There are hundreds of people all around the country and in other countries who know that I'm here through that uh, prayer update that I send out. But this time I've been getting stuff coming in unexpectedly. People who have said, we're praying for you at Deltona. And it was really including again today. And so I, I believe that some of the answers to prayer I have seen has been because numbers of people have been praying. And of course, we've had two official prayer meetings after the services. I'm sure many others have been praying. Some of us have been begging him for the bread, begging him for the bread. And I believe he has sent it down. Then I want to tell you also, without getting into detail here, today I had some of the most remarkable answers to prayer, and nobody knows them all. So a few of you I've told a couple. Of, you don't know. Today has been a phenomenal day. And you know, when God answers your prayers and uh, gives you things that you ask for, it almost makes you think there's a God. I'm just kidding. And boy, do we ever have proof all the time not only of the, God, the Lord's existence, but of his loving care and his fatherhood toward us. And I give him praise also. But a pastor's been my friend this week. We've had a good time together. I've appreciated his, um, uh, his uh, introductions. You know, uh, when I travel around the country as a special speaker each night of the week, uh, many times uh, pastors uh, make an introduction of me every night. I think at least one night you didn't even do it, right? Which was fine with me because I think that good men run out of things to say, especially good things to say. And you know, toward the end of the week, I'm expecting them to tell everybody my weight, my height, my eye color, my blood type. But uh, actually, uh, Brother uh, uh, Hershen Roder has been especially gracious to me, and this was a very nice uh, introduction and a reminder of our relationship tonight, and I appreciate him and you in so many ways. Now, what an account we're about to read. I've had people over the years say, I don't read the Bible because it's boring. I don't know what Bible they're reading or what book they chose. If you understand any book of the Bible, they're all exciting. But the Acts of the Apostles? Look at chapter 7. We're going down toward the end of it. We're actually going to read the end of the chapter, starting with verse 54. And I know there's a lot going on when we jump right into the middle of this account, but I'll get back and explain it to you in just a second. 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they 
gnashed on him with their teeth. Picture that one. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Verse 59. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, I've been following the sermons. I suppose you would imagine that I would. But we have actually been going somewhere together, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to do this, but just a little bit of a review. If you came to Sunday school Sunday morning, did you ever get a head start? We actually read from Luke 11 about the promise concerning praying for the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you won't question my doctrinal orthodoxy by just telling you that. You'll have to ask the people who were in Sunday school. Praying for Holy Spirit, the power and blessing of the Holy Spirit for which we as children have a right to pray the Father. Sunday morning, my whole sermon was about sinners and about their relationship to Jesus Christ all throughout the book of Luke even down to the sinner who called, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Sunday night we spoke about what can happen and ought to happen when a sinner meets a saint. And it has to do with the condition of the saint. We went to the book of John, learned about what abiding in Christ is, which is the way Christians ought to live all the time. We learned about the choices sinners make even before they ever hear the gospel. And then Monday night, I think it was, we went to the book of Acts, and that's why I'm talking about it now. You cannot understand revival without looking at the book of Acts. Simplifying, here's why. In the book of John, especially 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, we learn what the abundant life is and how to live it, the normal Christian life. And then in the book of Acts, which is the account of what the Christians did after Jesus went to heaven, we get to look at it. John, Jesus explains it, the dynamics, the comforter, bearing fruit, then in the book of Acts, after he's gone to heaven and sent the Holy Ghost, we get to look at what a revived church looks like and what revived and spirit-filled individuals look like. And I tell you, that helps a lot. So Monday night, we saw one verse that described a revival. And then we moved on and moved on. Ephesians, about the Holy Ghost in our family. Uh, Wednesday night, we talked about substituting standards for the Spirit. Did you know, folks, how many of you knew we live in the New Testament? The big difference for a believer between the Old Testament and the New is they didn't have the Holy Ghost and we do. And you know what? Why go back to only the rules? I believe in the rules. I wouldn't put my kids in a Christian school that didn't have consistently enforced rules. I believe in rules, I told you that. But I'll tell you what, rules are a very sterile substitute for the Spirit of God. And then we went on in 2 Corinthians on Thursday night, that's last night, and talked about how we can open blind eyes. Even the impossible can be reached for Jesus Christ. If we will preach Christ and not religion, and if we'll show them Jesus as well as talk about it. 
Tonight we're back in Acts. Why? I follow the book of Acts, the account, telling us how the Christians were filled with the Spirit, how they followed the Lord's command to evangelize their city and so on, and how each of them learned how to live an obedient life for Christ, what the church was like and so on. And then it's as if the Lord focuses on one man. Here comes the spotlight on one man in the group. I think he was probably saved on the day of Pentecost. A relatively new convert. Stephen. The deacon. And you find the focus put on him in chapter 6 and then we move into chapter 7. An amazing thing that happens. Now you noticed what happened to Stephen in this story. They killed him. Why would God focus on Stephen and just tell us how he died? I'll tell you how. Why? Because death is usually a snapshot of a person's life. Now, when I was young, I used to think that a lot of people, maybe most people, died like this. They got weaker and weaker and weaker, and they were bedridden and then they called the family and they would come from Albuquerque and from Boston and they would come by the bedside of their loved one they would have these important talks with shallow breathing and finally after a long dragged off out ordeal they would finally die now maybe it's different different places but I was a pastor of the same church up there in Michigan for 34 years, and it very, very rarely happened that way. Usually, death was fast. Now, there are two ways to make a choice about how you die. One way is, I'd like to go fast. That's easy for the Christian who died, but hard on everybody else. Or, I'll go slow. That's hard on the person who dies, although it makes it so that the loved ones can let them go. I know that's true. But you know what? You don't get to choose how you die. But one thing is for sure, usually death is a snapshot of life. In other words, you'll die the way you live. You won't get a long chance. You won't get a long uh, a chance to amend your ways, make apologies, straighten things out, pay bills, finally tell your wife that you love her. You won't get a chance to do all that. The way you live is probably the way you're going to die. On that last day, it's going to be a snapshot of your whole life. And of course today, many, many of us are remembering the death of a man who was significant in our life, and this is not a sermon about him, but President Kennedy. There are folks all over this room who remember exactly where you were when you got the news. And you probably remember a whole lot about how you felt. But you know what? John F. Kennedy was a man. And he died as he lived, for better or for worse. He didn't get a chance to make amends, changes. He just went. Like people usually do. And the focus on Stephen's martyrdom, his death, is so we can get a snapshot of his life. He died the way he lives. And you know what this is? It's a photograph of a spirit-filled Christian. Brother Flanders, if I ever got in on John 13 through 17, if I ever became a spirit-filled Christian, what would I be like? Like Stephen. Just like Stephen. And we're going to take our time to take a good look at how it was when he died. And I wrote at the top of my paper, what a way to go. Now let me explain that to you and defend myself a little bit. You mean you'd like to die with people murdering you? Bloody a cracked skull? Are you nuts? Well, let me ask you a question. Would you rather die in a nursing home out of your mind for about two or three years, drooling 
begging God to take you for many, many months. You think that's a better way to go? To tell you the truth, we're all going to die. And to tell you the truth, if it's in the will of God, I would rather die on the front lines of the gospel like that than to die the way many of us probably will die. But as I said, we have no choice. But how will you die? I'll tell you how you'll probably die. The way you live. If you live immoral, you'll die immoral. If you live a shyster, you'll die a shyster. And the preacher won't say it at the funeral, but everybody will know what a crook you were. If you live faithful to the Lord, you'll die faithful. If you are up and down, back and forth, in and out of church, not really serving God, that's probably the way you'll come to the end. And now I want to ask you something. Will you not give yourself to God tonight? like you'll see Stephen did? Will you not see the issues and just plain give yourself to God? Nobody can give you to God except you. Won't you do it? Lord, we pray that we would get a picture of what you have for us. And help us, Lord, to fit into that picture by giving ourselves to you. We pray for these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. So how did Stephen die? Number one, he died witnessing to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus commanded, Ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. He taught us to be witnesses for him. Did you know the word martyr means witness? If you were looking in the Greek New Testament, the word witness is spelled martyr. That's what it means. He died as the first Christian martyr. Why did he die? He was a witness. Someone here says, oh, I'm a witness. I'm a silent witness. We pay our bills. We mow our lawn. We're nice to the neighbor kids. People look at us and say, Man, I'd like to be like them. I wish I was born again so I could mow my lawn, pay my bills, take my wife out on our anniversary. Those are nice people. I just want to be saved. Now, I want to tell you something, friends. If you believe that that's the way it is, you're living in a fairy tale. There's no such thing as a silent witness. There isn't. The fact is, a witness always uses his mouth. If they call you to the witness stand at a court and you sat there and a question was asked and you just smiled and you didn't answer the question and the prosecutor said, Your Honor, would you direct the witness to answer? And then you just smiled and the judge said, Now, you are ordered to answer the prosecutor's question. If you said, That's not what I do, Your Honor. I'm a silent witness. Now, I know he asked me a direct question. Where were you on June the 3rd? And I know that, but I really think the jury can tell where I was on June the 3rd by the look on my face and the joy in my heart. Hogwash. A witness means that you tell someone something you know by experience. And there is no witness that doesn't witness. And that's what he was doing when he died. Do you want to read the end of his witness? He had been called before the council of Jerusalem, the very men who had plotted and executed the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Now, some months, maybe a couple of years after Christ had died and risen again, the deacon Stephen was called before them because of his active witnessing. And they were going to do something about him. And he instead uses the opportunity to tell them what Jesus Christ has done for the world. But he ends his talk this way. Look at verse 51. Here's him witnessing. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. 
as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That's what he said. He gave them everything a person needs to be saved. He gave them the fact that Jesus Christ was a fulfillment of prophecy. He is the just one, the Savior who came to die for our sins. He told men who claimed to be upright and righteous that they had not kept the law. Even though they claimed to defend the law, they were lawbreakers. And that is lawbreakers, they faced the justice of God for their final crime of murdering and betraying the Son of God. Now, I would say, he was witnessing, wouldn't you? We had a man in our country church who was a phenomenal witness. He was a businessman who and he got saved back in the 60s. And almost immediately he started talking to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now he really couldn't read. He was a businessman, but his wife was in business with him. She did all the reading and writing. He couldn't read. After he became a Christian, he wanted to read the Bible. And his wife, Thelma, taught him how to read the Bible. And he did. But he was not a man highly educated. But in his business, when he dealt with the public, he would regularly give out gospel tracts, talk to people about the Lord. I had been many times with this man to go and give a witness to someone, and he was very clever. I'm going to tell you, you know some people who are witnesses for Jesus Christ, and they're really clever, not me. I never can think of the right thing to say. Have you ever had that happen? Where somebody said something, and... You surely could have said something to uh, give them the gospel, but I never can think of it until like three hours later, and then it's too late. But Richard, he was sharp. I'm telling you, he was clever. He was the normal way that he would bring up a witness. We would be somewhere, and he would say this. Now I want to talk to you about your salvation. That's what you call clever, subtle, Salesman-like, it's exactly what he did. I've heard him say it many times. Now I want to talk to you about your salvation. Where are you going to go when you die? Just like that. And then he'd have the Bible verses open and he'd witness to people. When he did die, when Richard died, he had two or three Bibles cherished by his children that were full of the names of people he had won to Jesus Christ over the years. And he was still witnessing right literally at the end. He got a heart problem that wasn't going to get better, and he was going to die. And he was getting weaker and weaker. Incidentally, a couple of days before he finally passed away, Brother Hershen wrote her, Richard was on the lawnmower mowing the church lawn. And he was witnessing. I know that he got so he would go to warmer areas during the cold part of the winter. Smart people in Michigan always do that when they're older. But it wasn't Florida, he would go to Arizona every year. But before he left, he would go around to certain people he had talked to about Christ and talk to them again. But this is the phenomenal part. Toward the end, I'm talking about that final year, I don't think he even went to Arizona because he wasn't well enough. You know what he did? If he could get into the car, he went to several people I could name you and said, you know what? I'm not going to be here much longer. My heart is going to stop. And I wanted to see if I could talk to you again about getting saved, because I would sure like to see you saved before I die. And did you know, some of them did get saved before he died. You know what he was doing? He was doing what everybody ought to do, what I ought to do, and that is talk to people all the time. Did you know they won't arrest you for that? Did you know people don't pull out a gun and shoot you between the eyes because you asked them about eternity? Did you know there's no real reason why we couldn't be more active about witnessing? And while I'm talking about it, what was Stephen's style that day? Subtle, tactful. Every Christian should be Christ-like gentle, loving, but listen to him. You stiff-necked, 
You always resist the Holy Ghost just like your fathers. And you know what you've done? You have murdered the Son of God and betrayed him. And you say you keep the law, but you don't keep the law. Now, I never read anything like that in a personal evangelism book. I've never been with anyone who talked like that. But Brother Hershon wrote, I remember one time when I was back home where we live just for a few days and decided to make a few visits down in our little town of people I knew to try to talk to them more about the Lord. I remember going from one home to another home and another one. And I didn't get anybody upset. I didn't offend anybody. When I was driving back to my house, it was as if the Lord said to me, Mr. Flanders, did you really expect to affect anybody's life today? And you know what? If somebody gets saved, sometime somebody's got to tell them the truth. We ought to be loving, but some of the talk we give to the people who don't know Jesus Christ needs to be straight talk. If somebody's going to hell, don't you think someone ought to tell them in plain language they're going to hell? I don't mean the minute you walk in the door. I don't mean with a hard face. I'm talking with a broken heart saying, I can't walk away from you. Not like this. Would that do harm? But what I know is Stephen that day, the day he died, he was giving men straight talk about their real condition before God. And I know that just about everybody needs straight talk sometime. What do you think? Matter of fact, let me ask you, whether it was about salvation or anything else, are any of you tonight grateful for someone who cared enough about you to look you in the eye and tell you the truth? Do any of you think back to someone who may have spared you great problems because they cared enough not to be just gentle, but to be straight with you? How many of you are thankful for somebody like you and that in your life? Well, be somebody like that. What was he doing when he died? He died witnessing to Jesus. Number two, he died, quote, full of the Holy Ghost. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. They gnashed on him with their teeth, but he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God. Now when you get saved, you get sealed with the Holy Spirit. And when you finally surrender all, I surrender all. When you finally conform to the will of God, when you finally yoke up with Jesus Christ where your life is, whatever, Lord, I'll do whatever. That's when you're full of the Holy Ghost. Sealed with the Holy Ghost? Every believer here is. But will you ever be full of the Holy Ghost? How patient are you? How long will it take for all of us to surrender everything to Jesus Christ and begin living every day for him? What's it going to take? He was full of the Holy Ghost, and we read in chapter 6, that as a spirit-filled man, he was not only full of the Holy Ghost, he was full of wisdom, full of faith, and full of power. And you know how that was? You have someone in you who has everything you need. And when you let him take control of you, you have what he has. Matter of fact, in Acts 4, we read the other night, they said, Lord, we need boldness to speak your word. We need boldness to speak your word. And you know what God gave them? He didn't just give them boldness. He filled them with the Holy Ghost. You want to know why? The Holy Ghost is bold. Now, you may have a lot of problems. You may be intimidated. You may have some weaknesses. But the one inside you has no problems, no weaknesses.
And he's there to give you everything you need. And if we and when we surrender to him all the way, we get what he is. And that was Stephen, a man full of wisdom and faith and power because he was full of the Holy Ghost. And at the end of chapter 6, the Bible says something else about Stephen. They hold him before the council, and the council members notice something, and I think some of you will remember, and some of you are looking back. That's what you call an open book test or cheating. What does it say at the end? They looked at him, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. Do you know what an angel looks like? I don't. But I know what an angel doesn't look like. It doesn't mean he was effeminate, sweet, pink. Everyone who ever actually saw an angel in the Bible was terrified. And an angel being an angel always had to say, fear not. And I'm going to tell you, I believe that council of wicked bloodthirsty men were intimidated by the young man who sat there with such a look on his face as they had never seen. A look that people get when they're full of the Holy Ghost. Like we talked about last night, that process where the Spirit of God changes my image into his. Pretty satisfied where you are, right? Come to church once in a while. Pluck a few quarters in the offering plate. Make pastor happy. Don't make any trouble. Pretty satisfied. You're going to heaven. What else could you want? And, uh, well, yeah, you've got a lot of things in your life that God probably doesn't like. But he'll tolerate it. When you get to heaven, you'll leave them all behind. Yeah, you're pretty satisfied where you are. What are you going to get dissatisfied? The Bible says about being filled with the Spirit that God pours water on them that are thirsty. You know what that means? And I've got young people who are in this church who are like that, and I can see it on their face where their mind is, I wish I had more. I wish... I could be more. I wish I could go to higher ground. Lord, take me all. And you know what half our problem is? Maybe three-fourths is we're satisfied where we are. Lukewarm. Abide in me. You will bear much fruit. Well, I think uh, back in 1957, I invited somebody to church, and they came, if I remember right. Never came back. Much fruit. Much fruit. Abide in me. Ask what you will, and it shall be done. But you're perfectly satisfied right where you are. Aren't you happy that we're here tonight, Friday night, listening to you, Flanders? What are you asking of us? There's the problem. The people who belong to God just love him lukewarm, tepid. Pastor Her- Hershenroder and I happen to be very fortunate to be in a place where we got to hear a man probably almost 90 years old who is more than likely the most knowledgeable historian about revival in the world that's alive today. And I remember one that afternoon, he got up and he said this to us. He said, you men are all praying for another great awakening. He said, I fear that if we got the awakening you prayed for, that that awakening would be just as tepid as you are. Do you know what tepid means? Lukewarm, 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 lukewarm. I don't care. I'm fine where I am. You know, if people who came to a church like this got to the place where they said, you know, this ain't right, and it's not right because I'm not right. 
I don't get my prayers answered. I'm not a witness. There's nothing supernatural in my life. What's wrong? I'll tell you a little thing. If we ever came to church like that, we probably wouldn't leave till late at night. And we'd get on our knees and find out from God what's wrong. And you know what would happen? We'd find out what's wrong. And I bet I know what it is. It's probably a bone of contention. In the book of James 4, it talks about being revived. God taking us up from where we are and lifting us up to where we ought to be. In that chapter, which I'm not preaching on, he says we need to humble ourselves and submit ourselves to God. And the language sounds like it means that there's an issue. Do you know what submit means? Submit means saying, I'm wrong. You're right. I'll do it your way. Whatever you say, no more resistance. And usually, something phenomenal happens for an individual who finally gets over their bone of contention and stops arguing with God and says, you're right. You're right. I'll love my wife. I'll respect my parents. I'll reverence my husband. You're right. I'll give you the first fruits of my increase. You're right, Lord. I'll be a member of a church. I'll be baptized. Oh, Lord, I'll apologize to that person even after all these years. And you know what, friends? If we would deal with a bone of contention and take it out of the way, God would not only forgive us, he'd fill us. And when he died, Stephen was full of God. Number three, he died ready to go. What a way to die. They heard his testimony. They were cut to the heart. That means they were under conviction. They gnashed on him with their teeth. I try to picture that. You know, you go to art galleries and you'll see religious art. They'll have religious art about David uh, killing the giant, religious art about Mary and the baby, but I have never seen a painting of somebody biting someone. They gnashed on him with their teeth. Then he looked up and he said, I see the Lord. I can see him. He's at the right hand of the Father. Oh, that infuriated him. And the Bible says that they threw him out of the city after they stopped their ears. I won't hear that. I know where they took him. Historians tell us that almost never did a major city have more than one place of execution. It was always outside the wall, but never more than one. You know what that means? They dragged Stephen out to Calvary. That's where he went. Right there in the vicinity of where his Savior had died. They drug him out there. Then it says they stoned him. I used to have the idea when I was a kid that stoning was like picking up rocks in the parking lot, throwing it at somebody. But it wasn't. Do you know how they killed people by stoning? They lifted up large, heavy boulders. And they would smash them down on a man's body and crush his bones and destroyed his organs. That's how he died. Down there on the ground, they stopped their ears, they screamed, and they threw those rocks down on him. And when he died, he cried out and called. He called with these words. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then it says he fell asleep. Fell asleep is the Bible term used for the death of a Christian. In Bible terms, when a Christian dies, his spirit leaves his body. That's the definition of death. The body without the spirit is dead. That's physical death. But for a Christian, you know what happens? The spirit goes to be with Jesus. To depart and be with Christ is far better. And the body falls asleep.
only Jesus Christ himself will bring the spirit back to the body, reconstruct and glorify the body, and you'll rise from the dead, body and spirit. But my real question now about Stephen and you and me dying is this. He died ready. How do you know that? What he said. Here he is. <laughs> Violent scene. He's going to die in a few minutes. Already has some organs destroyed. And he just looks up and he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He didn't die with his fingers crossed. He didn't die screaming for mercy. Oh, God, have mercy. God, have mercy. Oh, God, have mercy. I've been in the emergency room and here heard stuff like that. People dying with absolutely no thought that they were forgiven. People dying fearful of what really makes death fearful, and that's the judgment to come. People dying aware of their guilt. Oh, God! God, have mercy! That's not Stephen. Stephen just says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And the reason was, he knew where he was going. Do you? Did you know the Bible says there's a way for a person in this life to be positive, that their sins are forgiven, and that they're guaranteed heaven? It's possible in this life, based on the Bible, to have your salvation settled, a done deal. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Bible speaks of it this way. You turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and await for his son from heaven. Past, present, future. But our salvation is past. You turn to God from idols. You repent it and believe. It's a done deal. <laughs> and did you know when you repent and believe on Jesus Christ, it is a done deal. You have everlasting life. Your sins are forgiven. Is it a done deal for you? Second Tim Timothy chapter 1. The last book in the Bible written by the Apostle Paul just before he died. In verse chapter 1, he said this. Timothy, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. He said, I know. He says, hey, Timothy, don't worry about me. If they take my head off, I know where I'm going. How do you know? I know whom I know him. He is faithful. He is true. He is loving. He is merciful. And I know that he's able to keep what I committed to him against that day. What was that? My soul. He says, Timothy, one day, listen to me back there. One day, Paul was saying, I committed the saving of my soul to Jesus Christ. I couldn't save my own soul, but he died for me. So I committed the saving of my soul to Jesus Christ. And today I'm persuaded that he's able to keep his commitment. And my friends, he is. And if you commit the saving of your soul to Jesus Christ, you'll die sure. What a way to go. And then there's 1 John chapter 5. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And with the words that are written, you can be sure. You know verses in the Bible that say, if you do this, you shall be saved. Are valuable verses because if you do this, then you have God's word for the fact that you are saved. Went to see a man that was sent home to die. I had shown him the way to Christ at the hospital, but he had made no decision. I went out there because I was told he would be dying in the next couple of days, so I went out to see him one more time. He invited me in. I sat down. I said, let me ask you, did you ever get a chance to read that little book that I left with you at the hospital to read? He said, yes, I did that very day. I read it all the way through. I said at the end of the book, Dr. Rice suggests that you pray from your own heart, asking Jesus Christ to save you. 
calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. Now, sir, let me ask you something. After you read the book, did you pray and ask Jesus Christ to be your Savior? He looked at me and he said, I sure did. I said, you did? I said, are you telling me that alone there in the ICU, you prayed the prayer of a sinner asking the Son of God to save your soul? He said, I sure did. Well, let me read you some verses. So I read the ones you would have read. The last one says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. After reading that, I said to him, let me ask you a question. You and I both know it won't be too long before you'll leave this life. So let me ask you, whenever it is, do you know for sure that when you die, you're going to go to heaven? He says, yes, I do. I said, how do you know? And he said, Pastor, I know I'm going to heaven because I have a written guarantee. And I said, that's the best answer I ever heard. Because it is written, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if you have called upon the name of the Lord from your heart, the word of God says you're saved. And you know what that is? A written guarantee. And if God says I'm going to heaven, I'm going there. So he very calmly said, Lord Jesus, it's time to see my spirit. Off he went. He died ready to go. Will you? You know what you need to do? You need to decide right now you're not leaving this church until you have a talk with someone who knows the Bible well enough to lead you to Christ. You need to say, I mean, this is your responsibility. Are you listening back there? You need to decide right now, I'm not going into that parking lot until I talk to the preacher or somebody here about how to be saved. Because I'm going to tell you, the way of salvation is simple enough that someone could take the Bible and show you how, and you could be saved tonight. That's what you ought to do. Last thing about Stephen dying. He not only called and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He was also heard to say, Lord, lay not this sin to your to their charge. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Now, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that Stephen, there at the end of his life, was modeling, copying, and remembering someone else's death. The death of Jesus Christ. Maybe Stephen was there and saw it. The Lord Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Stephen says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he says, Lord, they're killing me. But lay not their sin to their charge. He died praying for his enemies. Now, you still thinking? Can I ask you something? Were the murderers of Stephen absolved of their guilt because of that prayer? Did none of them ever have to answer to God for killing Stephen? Because he said, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. What do you think? I got a bigger question for you. All those people out there who howled and cried for the blood of Jesus, and when asked, said, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Those elders, scribes, and priests, those soldiers who nailed him to the cross, do you think all of them were absolved of the murder of Jesus Christ because he said, Father, forgive them? He died for them. But friends, I want to tell you something. Nobody is forgiven who doesn't repent. You know what these were? Prayers. They were not absolving them of sins that had to be repented of. 
They were prayers. The prayer of Jesus Christ nailed to the cross was answered, I think, on the day of Pentecost. When thousands of these very people cried out and said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent! And they did. And they were forgiven. The prayer of Stephen, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge, was answered when a young man holding their coats thought twice about what he had done and repented and became Paul the evangelist. What I'm saying is he was praying for his enemies. I don't think that there is a full reconciliation with an enemy who won't repent. No Christian ought to have bitterness or ought to withhold good from even his enemies. We are to bless them. We are to give them good things, like the Father sends good things on his enemies. But an enemy, by definition, is a person I have approached seeking to reconcile, and he won't do it. Or it's a person that I did approach, and they wouldn't repent. Do I hate them? No. Are we reconciled? Maybe you think you're reconciled with someone where you have just let the issue go, but I got a question for you. If they called you after church tonight after all these years and told you they were, were sorry, would it be better? Yes, it would be better because you're not reconciled. You may not hold an issue against them. And that's not the question about Stephen, the way he died. You cannot control whether you live or die, die reconciled. I remember, I think, the first time I had somebody who wouldn't reconcile with me. I was always a guy who would go to someone and say, you know what, I wronged you, would you forgive me? I was always successful with it. But there was an unsaved man in our neighborhood where I had to take care of something that did damage to one of his relatives. I had to, it was a legal matter. I'm talking about I had to call the police. He became so angry at me. I've been so used to approaching people, asking God to help me, I was gonna go to him, explain to him what happened, explain to him that I reached in my own pocket and paid his bail. He never knew that I did that. I wanted him to know that I loved the young man even though I had to call the police. I went to him. He threatened me and told me to leave his property. I remember the sinking feeling I had going back to my house. It was the first time, as far as I knew, I had anybody on the face of the earth who hated my guts. And it stayed that way for years. But I want to tell you something. It is not possible for you to control things so that you live without an enemy. But you know what you can do? You can do what you can do. You can be willing to forgive. You can desire reconciliation. You can do your part. Call him on the phone. Call her on the phone. Say, you know what? We've got an issue and we're Christians. I don't want to leave it there. I'll do all I can do. I'll take the blame, or at least for my part of it. Do what you can do. Do what you can do. But for some people, you can't do anything. Sometimes the people who wronged us are dead. Or unwilling. So Stephen couldn't die without an enemy, could he? He has no control over that. But you know what he could do? He could die willingly. To lose an enemy by forgiveness and reconciliation. Are you? You know a good way to do that? I've had to deal with it. A good way to get over angst, anger against an enemy is to pray for him. Like Stephen did. His last breath wasn't praying for his mother, wasn't praying for his church. He was praying for the people who were murdering him. 
Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And the sound of his prayer went directly to the heart of that young man, Saul, who later became a Christian. And you know what, friends? If we leave this week in a revived state, it will not happen until you are willing to reconcile with every human being on the face of the earth. I'm talking about from your end of it. From your end, if he said, will you forgive me? You will not even hesitate. You will say, yes, for Jesus' sake, I will. It hasn't happened yet. But I'll tell you how to get there. Pray for it. I had a few enemies. This would be back, I think, in the 80s. And you're going to think I'm Richard Nixon. I had an enemies list. It was my prayer list. Prayed for them every day, every day, every day. You know what I saw? People checked off the list. I remember praying for somebody. It says, do them good. I saw something I could genuinely do good for them. They wouldn't have a thing to do with me. And my, I said to my wife, I said, you know, she would love all of these. So we bought it for her, mailed it to her, sent a little letter, not a real syrupy one, like, we in Christian love are sending you a gift in spite of your bitterness and harsh anger. No, it wasn't one of those. It was just a little note that said, we found this, thought you would like it. Love, Pastor Mrs. Cannon. Now I remember the day I got a letter in the mail from that house. And I opened it up, and it just said this. Boy, this is great. I can really use it. And then she said, and everything's okay. Sign March. And I'm going to tell you, that list got checked off, because you know why? I prayed for them. And you know what? If we're going to die praying for our enemies, we're going to have to live praying for them. And some of us have enemies by some definition who live under your roof. And there are people who came tonight who aren't speaking to somebody right at your house. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to get our prayers answered. We're not going to walk with God. It's not going to be right until from our side. We do what we can do. And you know what? I've dealt with all this junk of, oh, yeah? Well, I'll tell you what. He'll come crawling to me. I'm not going to approach him. Although Jesus Christ said, if he trespasses against you, you go to him. If you offended him, you go to him. It's love. Love. Love God's love. God's love motivating us to reconcile. He died praying for his enemies. Will you let God have you? That's who Stephen was. He was a man who gave God all he was. Will you let God have his way tonight? Let's bow our heads. Oh, Lord, we really want to say yes. Lord, thank you for pointing out the issues, the sticking points that make it hard for us to say yes, you can have your way. Lord, you're always right. If we disagree with you, we're the one that's wrong. Oh, Lord, help us to settle this. Help us to lay it down. Help us, Lord, tonight to give ourselves to you. Oh, God, it can happen. May it happen. I'm asking this. Who says, Brother Flanders, during the invitation, I need to find a place to pray for my enemy? Not a quiet little whisper. I'm not saying it should be loud. But I mean where you get up, walk to the front, and spend quality time not worrying about whether the service is over, praying for the enemy by name. Doesn't it hurt you that they hurt? Don't you realize that God loves them? Has it ever occurred to you that they might tonight be praying for you? Can't you do your side of it and say, Lord, send us healing, starting with me? Who would say, Brother Flanders, there's somebody like that I should be praying for tonight. Would you raise your hand? Oh, thank God for you. Sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for reminding us of your love for people. 
and for putting it in our heart to pray for them. Lord, may that happen tonight. Get the devil out of this room, Lord. We don't have time for him. We have time for you. Lord, may he not bother us, distract us, and may we not pay attention to him, but may we follow the lead of your spirit. With our heads bowed in a minute, we're going to stand up, and you folks who are going to pray for an enemy, when we stand up, forget everything else. Just go to the front and find a place to kneel or sit and pray, and pray quality time for that person till God gives you peace. Who in the room, young or old, would say, Mr. Flanders, I hear what you say. I may not understand it all, but I, for one, want everything that God has for me. If there's a way for the likes of me to be full of the Holy Ghost, with the face that shines with Jesus' face, with power and wisdom and faith, if there's a way for me to learn how to surrender to him in such a way he will use me in this world, I'd like to be that person. I really would. If that's the cry of your heart and your thirst, would you put your hand right up? If there's anybody in the room who would like someday to be full of the Holy Ghost, it's me holding it up, taking it down. Would you talk to the Lord about that right now and deal with the bone of contention that just might be in the way? Who would say, Brother Flanders, there are things about the way I live today that make it so I don't want it to be my last day. But I know how to deal with them, and I'm going to confess them. Things that were in my life today, I wouldn't want to have happened on the day I die. And the Lord's reminded me of them. And I'm going to talk to the Lord and confess my sins and get clean. If that would be you, shoot your hand right up. Holding it up. Who cares if anybody sees it? And take it down. Let's stand together, can we? As we stand together, they're going to find the song, Have Thine Own Way. But even before they do, if you need to come, you come forward right now. Preacher's standing in front of me. If you want help, he'll give you help. But if all you need is a place to make holy ground by you praying that prayer for that enemy or committing that life or whatever, you come right now. Don't wait for anybody else. But here's my question now. Who would say tonight, Brother Flanders, I'm not bragging on myself because this is no brag. But I can tell you, I know I'm on my way to heaven. Not because I've earned it or deserve it, but because the Son of God died for a filthy, dirty, undeserving, condemned sinners and offered to save one like me if I would let him do it. And he did. And to his glory, I raise my hand to tell you tonight, I know I'm saved. Would you raise your hand and take it down? Who would say before they find that song, Have Thine Own Way, don't play it yet. Who would say just to me? No one's looking but me. Mr. Flanders, I wish I could say I knew I was saved. But I don't know what would happen if I took my last, right now, my last breath. But I wish I knew. And I wish I was a sinner that had been saved. Would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Just hold it up. I'll see it. Take it down. I'll pray for you. And if you want me to, I'll help you who is like that. Now, Lord, make this a revival meeting. Oh, Lord, bend our stiff neck. Help us, Lord, to not, not be proud, but help us, Lord, want to want more than anything else to let you have your way. You've spoken to us. Now help us to give you a big yes, we pray. And now she starts to play the song with our heads bowed. If you want to come on this invitation, you come right now. Just let the Lord have his way. That's what a revival would be. If everybody just let him have his way, said, Lord, you're right. I've been wrong. <laughs> Lord, do it your way. Have your way. You're good. You're nothing but good. That's what revival is. Go home with a revival in your own heart. Let him have his way. That face, that person, 
they hurt us so bad. We want to see them suffer. But oh, how wrong that is. The Son of God who died for the privilege of forgiving people can give you grace to forgive anybody if you're willing. And that starts by praying for them. Some are doing that. Some have done it. Oh, what loads are being lifted off shoulders. They'll play some more. Will you let God have you tonight? Would you let him have his way? If you're not a Christian tonight, would you let Jesus Christ bring you into his own family and make you his? He's willing, are you? Tears, bent knees, earnest hearts, hungering and thirsting. Why don't we sing it? If you happen to know this song, we'll just do one stanza, but I'd like us all to.